I am Andrea. I'm um, a member of the Elixir Core team. I've been a member for about six years now. Um, so it, it, it's been a while. And uh, right now I'm an engineer for Apple. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's just get into it. Um, so recap of Elixir's release cycle. We usually release every six months, um, aiming for May and November. We're going to be a little late this time, but uh, we slowed down a little bit during the pandemic for because of reasons, but now we're back to a, to a six months release cycle and we're doing um, known breaking version. So we're on the on the 1.x release um, cycle and we're just releasing all backwards compatible new versions of Elixir. Um, let's start with Elixir 113 since that's the the since that, that version uh, uh, we, we didn't really introduce it or give an update about it uh, at this conference. So we're gonna start with that. Um, Elixir 113 came out in uh, uh, December 2021. Uh, we're gonna get a quick overview of the features. Uh, it was a it was a release very very focused on developer experience in general, so just making the lives of developers easier and the lives of people writing tools for developers also easier. Um, so main features in this release, um, let's go through them real quick. The first one, uh, semantic recompilation. So we generally did a bunch of work to make sure that the Elixir compiler doesn't recompile the whole project every time um, some things change. There were some situations where we would just do like a blanket recompilation of the whole project. Like if Mixed access changed or if a configuration changed, uh, right now the compiler is a little bit smarter. So it will track dependencies uh, with Erlang files as well. We do a little bit of better kind of a um, compilation time dependency management to, to reduce the number of recompilations or so just faster recompilations in general. Um, we, get, we did a bunch of mixxref improvements. Mixxref is a, is a tool for like, a, you know, a tracking a code and dependencies between modules and stuff like that. Uh, so we did a bunch of improvements there. So you can do prettier graphs, uh, dependency graphs and stuff like that. So usability improvements in general. Um, we introduced the module code.fragment, which is um, similar, like similar to the code module, but it deals with incomplete pieces of code. Um, so this is very useful for, for tooling because it can understand partially uh, like un unparsable pieces of code that are just partially uh, finished essentially. And an example of uh, something using this already is uh, IEX, which right now can do auto completion on um, things like you type the percentage sign and it will auto complete available structs. Um, so it, it, it figures out uh, you know, incomplete pieces of code and gives an API uh, to interact with that to, to tools and users. Um, and then the last thing we introduced is formatter plugin. So Elixir ships uh, with uh, its own formatter. It's been there for a few years, actually. I think I presented it here a few years ago, but um, it, it, it's been it's been there for a while. And right now we introduced um, formatter plugins, which is a way to hook into um, to hook into the the formatter. So essentially, you can do things like writing your own formatters. Um, this is an example of a markdown formatter that. Uh, can format sigils, so that the content of sigils as well as files with given extension. So you have, you can write whatever formatting logic you want, um, and then you just add the plugin to your formatter, and it will you will be able to to format different things that are not Elixir code, but just just with plugins. And this is being used already by, for example, HEX and in Phoenix Live View, where you can uh, format this uh, HEX HTML essentially. Uh, you just run mix format. They they wrote the for, uh, formatter plugin and it formats the code for you. So uh, a lot of usability improvements in general, um, tooling and developer experience. That was the, that was the focus of that release. Um, right now we're on uh, about to have 1.14 out. Um, the idea is to release it in June, 2022 um, with the RC coming out in the next few days or a couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, Elixir 1.14 is gonna require OTP 23. And we can go through the features that uh, that we're introducing real quick. The first one is a partition supervisor. Um, so this is a new module in Elixir 114, and it's going to be um, uh, it's it's going to make it better. Uh, it's going to make it easier to to deal with some some uh, scalability issues around the process architecture essentially. Uh, so sometimes uh, we have processes in our application that can become bottleneck processes, usually because they are singletons operating for the whole application. So imagine you have like a supervisor, like your application supervisor, and you have a, a single process that's that, that all the application talks to. It could be like a dynamic supervisor for, for something, or it could be like, you know, any global process. If the process's state can be partitioned easily, 
like it's the case usually, for example, with the dynamic supervisor, where the, the state is just a bunch of processes that it's supervising, then that's where partition supervisor comes in. So partition supervisor, the idea is that we'll, it will um, kind of mirror the process that you're supervising and is going to um, create multiple copies of that process of that process um, and is going to then uh, partition uh, uh, requests to those process processes based on like part a partition key uh, so to see it in action um, this is an example of starting uh, a partition supervisor under another supervisor or maybe the application supervisor uh, so you have partition supervisor you give it a child spec um, which is a process that the process that the partition supervisor will start and then uh, you give it a name just to refer to it uh, in this case let's imagine we have an error reporter process which is just a process that you send uh, messages to uh, to report errors to some error reporting service uh, uh, any of them and um, you can imagine that this is a case of probably a bottleneck process because if you would have only a single error reporter in your application all of the pro all of the other processes in your application would just uh, overload this process reporting errors potentially right because it's a single process in the whole application and the idea with the, the partition supervisor is that instead we can uh, partition uh, this uh, error reporter process and create multiple copies of it. Um, by default, the number of partition here we're not specifying any number of partition. The default default is the number of schedulers online. So you're going to partition based on how uh, many CPUs your your machine has essentially. Um, and uh, partition supervisor. Then the trick is that it provides this uh, like a via tuple as a standard uh, like way to to route to processes. Um, so it provides a via tuple that you can use in order to route to the to to the process based on the partition key. So in this case, we're uh, we're saying via uh, where part partition supervisor is the where the logic for the for the routing is, and then we're giving it the name. The last tuple uh, reporters is the name of the partition supervisor. Self is the partition key, so we're partitioning by PID here. What that means is that the same process is always going to be routed to the same error reporter process. Um, so so that it kind of provides a little bit of a back pressure, but you can use any partition key. So this is the idea with the with the partition supervisor. It's a pretty pretty uh, nice for when you need it. Essentially, uh, it's kind of a mirroring registry a little bit, which we introduced a few releases ago, but specifically geared towards supervision of the of the processes that can be easily replicated. Um, another feature in one fourteen, not super exciting, but uh, uh, it's slicing with steps. So in Elixir one twelve two releases ago, we released stepped ranges, which are ranges where you can specify a step instead of using the default of one. And uh, we didn't really use these uh, in any APIs. We only provided them like as is, like you can use them yourself, but we didn't really use them inside the language too much. Um, and now we started like to introduce them where we can. One example is enum slice, which you know slices a given enumerable based on the range. And now that, that supports steps. So it's, it's understanding what it's doing when it comes to steps. So here it's taking like every element, um, every second element starting from the, from the uh, second to the fifth, basically. Um, so it understands the steps. Uh, this is not the, the sort of APIs that you use a lot in day-to-day -day Elixir programming, I would say, but uh, they are quite uh, useful when working with numerical uh, data, with uh, matrices and uh, vectors, which is what happens a lot in numerical Elixir, numerical Elixir and Next. So that's where these APIs really like, kind of shine a little bit more. Um, another feature that I'm personally really excited about, it's uh, like a very tiny usability feature, but it's uh, very nice and it's an uh, expression-based inspection. So essentially what would happen before for a lot of data structures would be that uh, when you inspect um, the, the structure, we have a representation for the data structure. In this case, for example, we, we create a version struct and we inspect it and it comes out as this pound version thing that represents the data structure. The obvious problem with this is that if I copy this and paste it somewhere, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna work. It's not the Elixir code, all right? It's gonna be a comment. So that that makes it uh, a little bit uh, annoying to have to like retranslate re this to um, their, their data structure. In a lot of cases, we actually know how to get back to this data structure quite easily. And it's by calling version of parse again, for example. So that's what we're doing now. Uh, we're inspecting some, uh, some of data structures as uh, an expression, an Elixir expression that recreates that data structure. So we can do this for quite a quite a few data structures, as it, as it turns out. Um, 
for example, we implemented this for version, for version requirement, for map sets, for date dot range. We can't really implement it for, for more like dynamic things like PEDs and stuff like that. We can't implement it for everything, but for a lot of this kind of pure data structures, it's pretty pretty nice. So you, now you can, if you go to something like this, you can just paste the output and uh, copy the output and paste it somewhere, and it's gonna get you back the the same thing that you're that was being inspected basically. Uh, it's kind of inspired by Python's uh, uh, REPR rep, uh, method, which is the same thing. Like it's a, you implement it in an object uh, to, to return something that you can, this is a Python expression that recreates that object. So um, kind of the same deal if you're familiar with that. Um, last uh, but not least, it's not really something in Elixir, but it's gonna affect Elixir developers. So we have improved errors uh, in binary construction. That's kind of a feature of Erlang really. Um, there was a release in OTP 25 as part of the uh, Erlang and Ensign proposal 54. Uh, and it just like, it, it's it's much better usability around using the, the you know binary concatenation and stuff like that. So for example, here you can see what happened uh, before, which is that if you try to concatenate Something that's not a binary with a binary just gives you an argument error, which is quite you know hard to debug and hard to follow. Um, right now, it's gonna give you a much better error message where it says like what's wrong, where where is wrong, what what the data involved is, and it's much easier to debug. Um, so yeah, lots of uh, uh, not 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 very many uh, new features, but uh, that's uh, language is pretty mature, so we're um, working away at like just making developer experience better and and. Uh, um, tweaking things and polishing things. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, reach out on the website or reach out to me personally on Twitter or uh, wherever you can find me there. And uh, I think that's uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Andrea and the core team. Amazing work as always. I mean, I love the way you always put the developer experience first. That's Huge kudos for that. We may have time for one question um, from the room. I don't see anything on Hoover. So please step forward to the mic and yeah, who dares? Or we have the mic coming to you. Yes. Uh, what does the roadmap look like for uh, version 1.15? 1 1.15, I, I have uh, no idea. This is so we're focused on 1.14, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get there once we release 1.14. Uh, in general, like I can tell you that the common theme uh, uh, in in the last few releases that is that there's there are no huge things coming because the language has been quite stable. So we're we're working on a lot of uh, like. Yeah, what we can improve is usually around developer experience and like around like better better tooling and uh, and stuff like that. So it's a good sign, I think, that the ecosystem, like Elixir provides enough tools for the ecosystem to build the cool stuff on their own without the, having to change the language. Essentially, that's my that's my take. Awesome. Um, thanks again, Andrea. Uh, big hand.